welcome to Fish Lake Bible Church. If you would stand and join us in singing this month's song of the month, Joy to the World, Our God Saves. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Prepare him room and heaven and nature sing, let heaven and nature sing, and heaven, heaven and nature sing. Joy to the world, the Savior reigns, let men their songs implore. Joy, repeat, repeat the sounding joy. Hear the joyful sound of our offering as your saints bow down, as your people sing. We will rise with you, lifted on your wings, and the world will. See that our God saves, our God saves, there is hope in your name. joyful sound of our offering as your saints bow down as your people sing we will rise with you lifted on your wings and the world will see that our God Good morning. Merry Christmas. Pray with me. Father, we are so thankful that we get to come here this morning and worship you. We are thankful that we get to be reminded of the manger. We are thankful that we get to be reminded that uh, your salvation did not stop at the manger. And so, Father, we come before you this morning grateful, filled with praise, rejoicing at the presence of Jesus Christ in our lives. In your name, amen. You may be seated. Um, I was going to try and do a social experiment with my son. He did not want to participate. Um, I figured if I had a cute baby, you might listen to me better. I don't, yeah. So we'll try that again. 
another day. Uh, really, man, Merry Christmas. It's, it's Christmas Eve, so very rarely do we ever get to have like two Christmas Eve services. So uh, double dosing. But this evening at 6 p.m., we will have our yearly traditional Christmas Eve service here in the sanctuary at 6 p.m. Invite your friends, invite your family. If you guys don't have already plans, it'd be wonderful to worship with you, uh, worship our Lord together. And that's literally the only announcement I have. So short, sweet, two words you never associate with a pastor. As you make your way back to your seats, you may be seated and join us in singing, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Thee, God of glory, Lord above, hearts unfold like flowers before Thee, opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of day. Surround the earth and heavenly flag thy rays. Stars and angels sing around thee, center of unbroken praise. Field and forest, vale and mountain, flowery meadow, flashing sea. Chanting bird and flowing fountain, call us to rejoice. Ever blessing, ever bless. Well, sing of the joy of living, ocean depth of happy rest. Thou our Father, Christ our brother, all who live in love are thine. Teach us how to love each other, lift us to the joy divine. We honor victors in the midst of strife. Joyful music lifts us sunward in the triumph song of life. You would stand and join us in singing, O Come to the Altar. is calling Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for the drink from the well? Jesus is calling Oh, come to the altar the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave me hide your and mistakes come today there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling bring your sorrows and trade them for joy from the ashes 
ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Savior, isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Bow down before him, for he is Lord. Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Bear your cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the treasure you found. You may be seated. I am thankful for a lot of things, but two specific things that come to my mind. I'm thankful that we can come, period. That Jesus coming as a baby allows us to come as we are to receive the gift that he not just gave, but continues to give. Christmas spans so much more than just one day on our calendar. So I pray that you are hopeful this morning. I pray that you are thankful this morning. And if not, I pray the Lord uh, reminds you of those things. And the second thing I'm thankful for, Family Sunday. We get an opportunity to worship with our families. We do these things for two reasons. First, nowhere in the Bible does it say separate the kids on the other side of the building, uh, you know, away from their families. And then the second thing is, well, the first, so we get to worship with each other. Your kids get to see the example of worship modeled in your lives, but in others as well. And then the second is to give our children's ministry volunteers a break. Uh, today, they're just all gone. So, <laughs> so anyways, we're thankful for that. Uh, so I did want to mention, parents, uh, should you feel the need, don't 
feel the need just because your kiddo is making noise that you have to leave, but should you feel the need, we do have the foyer that has the speakers on so you can hear the sermon. We do have our multi-purpose room uh, down the way that you can sit and watch the service with some toys. Uh, and then Nursing Mothers, our library is available for you should you feel the need to use that as well. Find me uh, or one of our response team members if you need to find where to go, okay? As the men come, this is the part of our service where we take up our regular offering. Uh, again, we are not asking for your money. This is just an extension of our worship. As the Lord has given to us, so we give back to him in worship. So give as the Lord leads. Would you pray with me? Father, we are so thankful that you gave your son. We are so thankful that he came as a baby. Father, when everybody was expecting something completely different, you came as a baby, you came vulnerable, you came helpless, you came dependent upon the very creation you came to save. And Father, we just, we are so thankful that you came in a way that none of us were expecting because in that it reveals the true heart nature of Jesus and that you were like us, yet you were without sin. So we thank you for a savior who knows what it's like to be human, but is perfect all the while that we can worship and that we can trust who was qualified to die on the cross and to rise again. So, Father, we thank you that Christmas is so much more than just a holiday. Lord, would you fill our hearts with hope as we hear your word? Would you speak through Pastor Stover? Give him the words to say that when we see him, we don't see him, we see you. So, Lord, speak clearly today. Open our hearts and soften our hearts to be encouraged and convicted by your word. In your name, amen. <laughs> You would stand and join us in singing, I Speak Jesus.
just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Cause I know there is peace within his presence. I speak Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Now we have a special by my wife and I.
Gardner and Brooke. Merry Christmas to you all. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace. This sermon is not a Christmas sermon. Somebody said, uh oh. This is a Christ sermon. I am called to preach Christ. That is what every sermon should preach. Please turn to Luke chapter 8. And we're going to be talking about something that not a whole lot of people, I think, talk about on Christmas. There are things even the world talks about regarding Christians and the Christmas story around Christmas. Case in point, help me out with this. Uh, what do you know about Christmas? What are some people you know? What are some things you know? Does anybody here have you ever heard of the manger? The shepherds? Okay. The wise men? Uh, the, the angel, Gabriel. Fantastic. How about, what did the wise men bring? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh? Ooh, myrrh. <laughs> you had to be there. How about this one? Uh, even other things that the world says is Christmas. Uh, who here has heard of Santa Claus? Who here has heard of Frosty the Snowman? And my, my favorite this time of year is the Gerasene Demoniac. Anybody? That's what we're talking about today. We're going to talk about a man who was riddled, wrought, with demons. Not many people out there, the first thing they think about when they talk about Christmas and a Christmas Eve service and a Christmas sermon, demons. We are in Luke chapter 8 because last week we were in Luke chapter 8. We go about verse by verse and we teach the scriptures. And it was a conviction of mine and a conviction of mine on this day. I've been in Christmas and Easter crowds. I've been on the two most important Sundays of our calendar, Christmas and Easter. I can tell you as a non-believer everything about baby Jesus. He didn't threaten me a bit. A little, little baby wrapped in a manger. A little helpless thing. I could, te teach you, I could actually teach you and tell you everything about Easter. Yeah, there was a veil that was torn and Jesus died on the cross and all. I knew those. I was an unbeliever. I could tell you those things. My conviction is that if you don't know anything about this text this morning, I hope you walk away with the point of this sermon. And that is Christ Jesus as your Savior, your Deliverer, as He is the Deliverer and Savior of this man in the Gerasenes. He is the reason for the season. He is the reason for all seasons. He is the reason for life. He is the only reason for salvation. Not just, Jesus did not die so that you could get a three-day weekend. Jesus didn't die for a special thing on your calendar. He died to give you life and life abundantly. Let's pray and then let's go to the text. Our Heavenly Father, I am so thankful for your Son. I am so thankful for your plan of salvation. You sent your Son to step foot on this earth in the flesh, to do what we could never do, to live how we could never live, to die so that we may live. May we on this day recognize your Son's power and authority and recognize the hope that we only have in Him. You started salvation you finished salvation. It is a gift of grace by you alone. May we trust in that each and every day. And may you get the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. So let us meet this man. <clears throat> Starting in verse 26. Then they, stop right there, who's they? We just previously read, 
Last week, they are the disciples with Christ. They were in the boat, the stormy waters. Christ said, don't worry about the storm. I'm here. Eyes on me. They now reach their destination as Christ said that they would. Before Christ got into the boat on the other side of the lake, he knew where he was going to set foot and what the next thing to do was going to be. He sets foot in the land of the Gerasenes. They sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. When Jesus had stepped out on land, there was a man who met him from the city who had demons. When I read, I think. That may sound like a shocking statement, but I can't help it. Uh, in the past, when I would read, I would be a speed reader just to meet my assignments, and I really didn't slow down, and I really wasn't thinking all that much. When I read the scriptures, I stop and I think. When Jesus had stepped out on land, I thought in my head, I pictured his foot touching the sand, and I thought about Christ coming as a babe to the manger. When Christ sets his foot on a path, there is a reason and a purpose, and he is going to finish what he starts he stepped foot on this land, as we will see, to go out and to do a specific purpose, and that purpose is salvation. The same thing he did when he came as a baby. He set foot on this earth as the same foot that laid in the sand, the same baby laid in the manger for the same purpose. There is going to be salvation, and it's going to come from Christ alone. Christ doesn't do anything without purpose. He is not flippant. He is not careless. He's not reckless. He is intentional. He steps foot on this land, and he met him a man from the city who had demons. For a long time, he had worn no clothes. He had not lived in a house, but among the tombs. We live in a very strange culture who thinks their demons are their friends. I did a somewhat dangerous, dangerous Google search. Do people really believe demons can be their friends? And what popped up was a t-shirt line from a specific company that I don't even want to say. Demons are a girl's best friend. My best friends are demons. The ones I hear in my, in my head give me company. Demons are not humanity's friends. We live in a culture that laughs in the face of God and says, yep, I know I'm going to hell, but at least my friends will be there with me. The sadness of that reality that people state demons have no interest in your well-being. Take heart, O oh Christian. You put your faith in Jesus Christ. The darkness cannot inhabit the light. There is nowhere in the New Testament, early church, history of the church, where there is a demon-possessed Christian who has the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit when you put your faith in Jesus Christ and his work of salvation, his death, burial, resurrection. When you have him, no demon can get in. This man opened himself up to demons. We have very strong instances in our world, in our media, in the music, in movies, in games, in all sorts of things, to where we open ourselves up to attack. Specifically, those who do not have Christ, who think it'd be a fun time to go hang out and do a Ouija board and see what kind of ghosts we can contact. I don't believe in ghosts. I believe in angels and demons. And if you open up your house to that kind of company, they are not there to make you happy and to please you. Case in point, this man <laughs> lived among the tombs, lived among the caves, where dead people lie. In other instances in Scripture, we see that this man also harmed himself by cutting himself with sharp rocks, wore no clothes, naked, alone, 
cold, in the dark, afraid. That's where the demon wants you. They are not your friends. You would not open your door to a stranger to your home that says, when I get in there, I only seek to do your harm. Open up this door. Well, you know, they, they, they might have good intent. Would you open your door? No. Do not take part in the things of demons. There is a movement recently called Christian witchcraft where they can enjoy the best of both worlds. There is no best in the world of demons. It is nonsensical. Do not play with fire, otherwise you will get... This man not only had a demon, but we will see. He lived in such a way, such a lifestyle, that he had opened himself completely up to being inhabited by more than one. When this man, this outcast, saw Jesus, he cried out. This is not a type of cry where one falls and says, Lord, you're here. Lord, save me. He cried in anguish as if seeing the very Christ caused him great pain. And he fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? This is not a, What you doing here, bud? This is a, not a, I have no idea why you're here. This is a stiff-armed out, get away from me. Why are you even here right now? What are you doing here? You don't need to be here. I wasn't hurting anybody. I'm not harming everybody. You need to get out of here. This is the inflection of this text. What are you doing here? Son of the Most High God, he, he, he knows of Jesus. I've said it before. I'll say it again. You need to believe God, not believe in God. You need to know Jesus Christ as your Savior, not know of Jesus Christ. Son of the Most High God, what are you doing here? Okay, I beg you, do not torment me. He sounds tormented. He sounds tormented because he is in the presence of the Son of God. Much like the world today, they don't want Jesus around. They know who they are. They want nothing to do with Jesus. They will talk about everything and anything under the sun. Don't mention Jesus because all of a sudden, it's as if they're tormented. I beg you, do not torment me. For he, Christ, had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many a time it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. <sighs> Jesus commanded those demons to come out of the man. It had seized him, kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles. The people tried to control him. Man tried to control man. That does not work. Man tried to control demons. Who are you, O man, to speak against demons? In the, in the, the book of Jude, we read that the, angel, the archangel Michael did not even speak against Satan. Did not even speak against the demons. Because it said, the Lord deal with you. Right here in this moment, the Lord deal with this group of demons. And even here you can see, well, he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. Boy, that's strong. Who here would like to be that strong? And what are you sacrificing to gain that? They are not your friends. The world is not your friend. Those of us that have been shackled and know the pains of being imprisoned by shackles and chains and being driven out from the people around us, Demons want you to be alone. The enemy believes that he is one when he makes you think that you're alone and no one can help you. Man might not be able to help you. A lot of us, we don't wear chains literally around our wrists, but we wear them in here. 
We're shackled by our own consequences of our own sins. Man cannot help you. Jesus Christ can. He can free you from those chains. And we are witnesses of that. Those who have trusted in Christ, we're witnesses of that freedom. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? I thought Jesus knew everything. He does. This question is not for Jesus to know. There are people in the area witnessing this. There are the apostles that are witnessing this. When Jesus speaks and asks these questions, it is for the people around to hear and bear witness to what is going on. What is your name? And he said, Legion. In other text says, Legion, for we are many. For many demons had entered him. Again, I read and I think, I think nowadays there's this weird thing that we have in our culture where people are going to tell you exactly what they want to be called, their personal pronouns. When somebody tells me my pronouns are they and them, that means there is more than one inside of you that you're associating with. What's the difference? There's many within. He was riddled with demons. They had entered him because they felt free to enter him. There was no light. There was no life. There was no peace. Perfect opportunity to enter into this man. And they begged Jesus, him, not to command them to depart in the abyss. We live in a culture, a Christian culture, where there is a movement that says hell isn't real. The abyss isn't real. The darkness isn't real. Hell is just an allegory to a little place outside of the city of Jerusalem to where they used to bury people. It's not a real place. What were the demons afraid of then? Allegories? Parables? Do not send us into the abyss. Revelation chapter 9 talks about the abyss, and the abyss will be opened after the fifth trumpet judgment of God. That is a real place, and they're really afraid of it, and they're really talking to Christ. They still don't want nothing to do with him. They just know the punishment. They don't want relationship with him. They're just focused on the punishment. They don't want any part of that. Now, verse 32. A large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. And they, the demons, begged Christ, him, to let them, the demons, enter these pigs. My human perspective is, well, why would he allow that? Send them to the abyss. Give them everything they deserve. Their demons are bad. It's a good thing I'm not like them. It's a good thing I never want my own way. It's a good thing I never think about myself. It's a good thing that I've never in my life said, I don't want Jesus. Hmm. It's a good thing I never said, yeah, I know Jesus. And I hid in the dark and secluded myself so I could have my sin. Even the demons here, even the demons here saw grace by Christ because he allowed them. He gave them permission to enter the pigs. Could Christ have sent them to the abyss? Yes, but he didn't because there's something to learn here. Not for Jesus to learn, for us to learn. For the people around at that time to learn. Case in point, 27 years of my life, I lived like a demon. The sinner not saved by grace. I didn't want nothing to do with Jesus. I like baby Jesus, though. He was snuggable. I didn't like the adult Jesus. I didn't like the Savior Jesus. I didn't want him. At any point, could Jesus could have said, that's it, Tim. Hell? Yes, he could have. But by the grace of God, he didn't. He gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. Very particular words and sentence structure here in the Greek. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs. Pigs, not all. Not all of the pigs. Because then it separates by the word herd. And the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. 
The demons wanted to flee. The demons wanted to get out of the presence of the Lord. They were being tormented just being in his presence, so they wanted to get lost in the crowd. And their fear, their panic, their anxiety caused the stampede of the pigs. Not every single one of the pigs was consumed by a demon, but the demons were amongst them and caused chaos. And that's the direction that the herd went. What direction is the world going right now? Closer to Christ or let's get out of here? What's the result? They rushed down the steep bank into the lake and they drowned. They were among company that they felt safe to go into. They looked at the pigs and said, get us away from you, Lord. We want to go there. That's a nice, comfy place for us to enter in. The challenge this morning If Fish Lake Bible Church was right outside in the Gerasenes and the demons looked over and pointed at us, would the demons say, we feel safe there. Send us there. They felt safe to enter the pigs. Would they feel safe to enter you? Or do you already have the Holy Spirit residing within yourself that they're not going to get in? I hope and pray that they would feel drastically uncomfortable around your presence, because within your presence is the presence of the Holy Spirit, God himself. This is not to say <laughs> that the demons can't attack you, that they can't influence you, that they can't pull upon a thought that's already within your sinful heart and mind and lead you astray. The devil is prowling. He's prowling around. Why is he prowling around and not prowling within? Because he can't get in. But he's going to look at little opportunities to bite you on the heel, to snip at you, to growl at you and make you afraid. The demons, the enemy cannot get in if you have the Holy Spirit. The pigs, chaos was caused, panic. They were all going to their doom. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. And then the people went out to see what had happened, and they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. See, the herdsmen saw their livelihood just pummel over the side and drown. These herdsmen who have taken care of these pigs don't understand that the pigs never really even belong to them. Those were God's pigs. They belonged to him. God knew what he was doing. He knows what he's doing. The people see the livelihood go over the edge. What happened if you lost your job today? Would you be mad at God? Or would you trust and know that he knows what he's doing? Because remember, he just got out of the boat where that storm was. And what did he say? Eyes on me. I know the plan. I set foot on this earth. I know the plan. I was laid in a manger lowly to a small few. I know the plan. I will die on the cross in obedience to the Father. I know the plan. And I will come again someday, not to the obscure, but the whole world will see me and know that I am king. I know the plan. These men saw their livelihood and they missed the Lord completely. The man that they knew, they knew him. They found the man from whom the demons had gone. This wild, shackled, cutting outcast who lived in the tombs. They looked at him and they saw him clothed. He was scared naked in the dark. Now he was clothed. Not only was he clothed with actual clothes, he was clothed in the righteousness of Christ because Christ saved him. And they saw that he was in his right mind. He was in his right mind because the demons left. If you wasn't paying attention to that one, it's fine. He was in his right mind because he'd been freed. And what did he do with his right, focused mind? Sat at the feet of the Savior. He knew where he wanted to be. 
He didn't go run back into town. Now that he had enough right mind, he's going to get a job, and so then he can, he can build up his house, and then he can party all he wants because you only live once. He knew where he wanted to be. He was sitting at the feet of Christ, clothed in the righteousness of Christ, clothed in actual clothes and in his right focus mind, and they were afraid. They were responding like the demons. Missed the point entirely. Missed the power and authority of Christ. Missed it wholeheartedly. And yet I can't blame them for anything because we miss his power and authority a lot. We can look right past him and we can only focus on our circumstances or our feelings on the matter. And there are times when, there are times when Tim wants to be mad and it feels good to be mad. And I get into myself and I get into my pride and I get into my pity and I get into my... Well, the word of the Lord says this, be at peace and be still. Yeah, I know what he says. I just need to, I just, just back up. What are you doing here, Lord? They were afraid. They didn't want him. God revealed his son in a baby in a manger. God revealed to this world at that point in history himself in the form of human flesh. Power, signs, miracles, prophecies fulfilled to a T, exactly how God said it was going to happen. Yet today still people say, I want more proof. Either they say, I want more proof, I don't believe in you, or everything that you've done and said isn't good enough for me. Or, yeah, that's fine and all, I'm going to do it on my own. Humankind has a knack for keeping their arms stretched out like this, asking God, what are you doing here? And they don't understand the Savior says, I'm, I'm here for you. Jesus wasn't there for the pigs. Jesus wasn't there for the herdsmen. He came there for the one. And we see that in the following text. And those who had seen it, seen what had happened, told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed. Jesus did it. Jesus did it. How can you be at peace when you lost a loved one? Jesus does it. How can you trust in your security of your future eternally? How do you even know what any of this is? Jesus says it. How do you have life? How does any of this make sense, Jesus? Go to Adrian and say, Tim Stover's a pastor. How in the world did that happen, Jesus? Jesus did it. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked him to depart from them. We don't want you. Get out of here. You make us nervous. What are you doing here? Because they were seized with great fear, they responded like demons. So he got into the boat and returned. He didn't get into the boat and return because, oh, shucks, they didn't like me. He knew as soon as he set his foot on that, on that sandbar, when he got out and the, the, to the garrison lands, he knew he, he was coming to save. He knew the response he was going to get. Yet he got in the boat all the way over here on the other side of Galilee because he knew where he had to go to get who he's come to save. Christ came as a baby because he knew where he had to go and knew the people he was going to save. And yet the world responds with, not good enough. I'm just fine on my own. I don't need you. The scary focus of this last sentence, so he got into the boat and returned. <clears throat> Keep pushing him away. Keep telling him you don't want him. Keep telling him he's not good enough. And he may give you what you want. Do not respond like they respond. Understand that we need to respond like the man who has just been freed. The man from whom the demons had gone saw Jesus getting into the boat and realized something. 
He's heading over there. He's heading out. He begged him that he might be with him. Please, Savior, Master, Jesus, I want to go where you're going. Let me go where you're going. You're doing great things, signs and wonders. I want to be with you all the time. But Jesus sent him away, saying the same things he said to the disciples when he ascended, the same things he's telling us today from his word. Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. Declare what he's done for you. Has God saved you through his son? Then declare to others what God has done for you. And he went away sad and brokenhearted that he couldn't go on the mission trip. Sad and brokenhearted that he couldn't be seen with Jesus so the people would know that, yo, I'm, you know, I'm, one, of the, I'm one of the close ones. I, yeah. He went away proclaiming, shouting atop the mountain throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. So that's the same thing I'm going to tell everybody here. You don't need to be the biggest and best. He didn't go out and become the most grossing televangelist of all time. He didn't have Lamborghinis and mansions. He had Jesus. He was clothed in righteousness. He went home. And he proclaimed in the city that he lived who Jesus was and what he did. Men, go home. Go to your house where your wives and your children and your grandchildren and your family is. Tell them about Jesus. Go to your jobs. Tell them about Jesus. Tell everybody about Jesus. Wives, go home. Love your family like Jesus loved you. Love your husband like Jesus loved you. Tell others about him. You don't need to be the top dog in everything. I, I don't need to be the top dog in everything. I would just like to be a dog at the master's table, sitting at his feet. If I had a tail, I'd wag it because I'm with my master. He went away shouting on the mountaintops, and I guarantee you that he was shouting even in the valley. You know why? Because there's a reason he could sing in the valley, because there was a new song in his heart. And in the lowest parts of your day, the lowest parts of your life, Christ is still there shining because he came and he set foot on this earth. Save you. I can sing in the valley because I've been lower than that before. Dead in my sins, dead in the grave, dead spiritually. That's lower than the valley. All that dirt atop, the valley with Christ is much higher than dead in the grave. So sing in the valley. Shout in the mountaintops. Respond like the one who had just been freed. As soon as you have your freedom in Jesus Christ, when you profess in him, he is my savior, he's my king. I want to go where he's going. I want to go where he is. I want to know who he is. And I'm going to sing it on top of the mountain and I'm going to sing it in the valley. I'll sing it with tears running down my eyes during the pains and trials. God is good because he gave me Jesus. And I didn't deserve him. The first time Jesus Christ set his foot on this earth in the flesh as a baby and as a man in his ministry, promoting the kingdom of God and God's miracles and God's truth. (sighs) When he stepped foot on this earth, it was to the select few. Many saw him. But in comparison, 5,000 plus people versus the billions of people that will see him when he comes again. First, he came as a lowly babe in a manger. And in Revelation chapter 22, he is stating that he's coming again. The next time he comes, he will come as king of kings and lord of lords to establish his kingdom reign. And it is by grace that Jesus allowed the demons to go into the pigs. But even they knew this is only going to be for a little while. Because when he comes back again, we know our fate, our fate is sealed. If you trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, know that your fate is sealed. And that when he comes again, you can shout out and you can see him upon the clouds and you can say, there he is. There's my reason. There's my why. There's my wanna. I want to be with him. I want to be with him right now. But I can't. I'm still here. So I will preach like this is the last time you're ever going to hear me talk. You need Jesus Christ as your Savior. 
They need to repent and believe in him. You need to trust in his blood, the only one that could sacrifice anything so that you could be saved. And he sacrificed all of his entire life so that you may live. That is why we can sing in the valley. Christ says in Revelation chapter 22, starting in verse 6, And he, Christ, said to me, John the Apostle, who was writing these things down, These words are trustworthy and true, and the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. And behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. John goes on to speak. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things, and when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, you must not do that. This angel that showed him what is to come. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of this prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the evildoer still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. There is time still. There is grace still. Do not take it for granted. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha. I am the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside of those gates are the dogs and the sorcerers and the sexually immoral, the murderers, idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star, the spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty, come. Let the one who desires to take the water of life without price. It's without price for you because the price has already been paid by the blood of Jesus Christ. That is the reason, Christians, we celebrate Christmas. We celebrate Christ every day of the week. Mondays are rough, but Mondays are still a gift from God because you're still breathing. You can tell others what he's done for you. Praise him. He's the only one to praise. Verse 18, I warn everyone who hears the words of this prophecy of this book, if anybody adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and the holy city which are described in this book. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. He was before ages began. He set foot on this earth as a lowly babe. He took the position that you could not handle, and he died for the sins that you could not bear. And he's living again so that you may live in him. And he's coming back soon. Do not recoil like the Gerasenes and say, we don't want any of that. May you have a position before the Father because you are in the Son as the Gerasene demoniac. I hope you remember that name. He just wanted to sit at the feet of Christ. He wanted to be where he is. Don't worry. He is now. You want to be with the Christ right now. Don't worry, you will be when you put your faith in him. You can sing it in the valley because you've been deeper than that. There's a reason to sing it in the valley. There's the ring reason to shout it from amongst the mountaintop. Jesus Christ is King. He is Savior and Lord of Lords. Go home and tell people about what God has done in your life. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, you are so good. I can't even, even the English word good does not, does not do you justice, nor will it ever. I'm thankful for life. I'm thankful for grace. In your rich mercy, you have allowed man to continue on. Continue on in sin. You know that we are an imperfect people. That's who you come to save. 
those who know that they can't make it on their own, those who know that they can't trust in their works, please, Lord, continue to clothe us more and more in your Son's righteousness. May we be a simple people that all the things that we do, all the things that we think, all the things that we say, and all the things that we love point people to you. You are the reason for this and every other season. You are the reason that we can praise in the valley and on top of the mount. You are our God. Your kingdom will endure forever, and by the grace of Jesus Christ alone, we will reign with you forever as well. You are so good. Help us live like it. In Jesus' name, we all said, Amen. And as the worship team comes forward, we are going to, so aptly put, we're going to go tell it on the mountain. Thankful for Tanner. And uh, Tanner, did you read my sermon notes before we... No, hey, he didn't. Go tell it on the mountain. Praise him in the mountain. Praise him in the valley because you have a Savior. Make sense? Fantastic. that Jesus Christ is born. Jesus Christ.